Hey everybody, Steve here. Uh, we'll have another new episode of the Hashtag Higher Ed podcast for you next week. We're actually talking with Michael Powers. He is the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And in that episode, he is going to drop some serious knowledge about the people side of content strategy, a topic that, quite frankly, we have not adequately covered on the show thus far. In the meantime, we're re-releasing an episode from season one of the show featuring the talented team behind Stories at Notre Dame. This episode was one of my favorites in season one because I am a huge believer in the power of long-form storytelling. And in the time since the show, the team behind Stories at Notre Dame has actually doubled down on the platform. They recently launched a video version of Stories at Notre Dame as well as a new podcast diversifying the way that they tell stories on behalf of the university. Uh, This is one of my favorite projects happening in higher ed right now. I hope you enjoy the episode. Complete, I might add, with our theme music from last year. It may not have been popular with the masses, but it was near and dear to my heart. Uh, So we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, happy listening. This is the Hashtag Higher Ed Podcast, presented by eCity Interactive. E-City creates websites, marketing campaigns, and magic for higher ed institutions, large and small. Every digital challenge has a solution. E-City's talented team of problem solvers will help you find yours. And now, here's your host, Stephen App. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Hashtag Higher Ed Podcast. As usual, I'm your host, uh, Stephen App. We've had a pretty darn good run of podcast guests here in the last several weeks, and I'm excited because we're keeping that up today. Uh, We're talking storytelling and long-form storytelling with the University of Notre Dame, and in particular, Liz Harder, who is the social media manager, and Andy Fuller, the director of strategic content for the Fighting Irish. Uh, We are going to be talking about their features uh, aspect of their website and we have a lot to talk about, so I'm not going to waste time uh, setting the stage. Instead, I'll let our excellent guests uh, do that for us. Liz and Andy, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Hey, Steve. Great to be here. So, of course, I'm sure there's a, a large swath of our listeners who aren't familiar with stories at Notre Dame. So would you mind just briefly describing what this marketing endeavor has been for you? Yeah, so stories is just shorthand for strategic content, which is uh, the name of uh, our brand journalism unit at the the university. Basically, we are just looking to find stories involving the life and work of the university and um, telling them in the the most compelling way we know how uh, through a variety of medium, whether that's video, written text, uh, graphic animation, um, you name it. And what was the thinking behind the creation of Stories as a platform? So Stories came out of a a reorganization of our division uh, roughly three years ago. And also, I think, in conjunction with just some observations uh, we had about where media, mostly outside of higher ed, was was going. So uh, in, in the reorganization, we were looking to uh, really kind of beef up our owned media channels and be more intentional about the way we told stories uh, at, at the university. And so we were inspired by, you know, the work being done by uh, New York Times and their famous snowfall feature that came out in 2012 uh, and others. And we wanted to create a unit that uh, kind of took on the, the same uh, look and storytelling as uh, an enterprise. So uh, we knew we had to infuse our existing channels with with new content types to, to make that happen. And the, the logical choice at that time was, was nd.edu. And that's where most of our work has been uh, housed for the last three years. But as, as Liz can tell you, uh, you know, we've worked really hard to make our, our social channels uh, reflect the, the new content um, MO that we have too. Yeah, and I can imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking of you pitching this. We're going to do long form storytelling. We're going to tell the stories of our students, our alums, our, our faculty and staff. Uh, but we're not actually, there's no explicit call to action here. We're just going to storytell. Did you get any pushback? Or did you have to convince anybody that, hey, I know there's no immediate tie-in to applications or donations, but this is a worthy endeavor? Yeah, you know, at first, 
Not really. And it's funny that you say that because, man, you know, it'd be great if we lived in a world where um, just telling compelling stories about the work of your faculty didn't need defense, you know, and you, you could just go out and do that. But I recognize that's, you know, that's not always the case. But I think the, the key insight that we had is um, we're going to tell these stories in our voice using, you know, our uh, resources. But, you know, we recognize also that media has changed. And so there's a lot of external media outlets who are looking for good content and content done well. And so I think our insight was, you know, if we could use, if we do our jobs really well as an internal storytelling mechanism, those external media outlets uh, might take notice as well. And so we work in conjunction with our media relations team, and um, they're involved in, in story development and keep an eye on things. And they're pitching reporters uh, out there at, uh, you know, name the, the publication that makes sense. Um, and say, hey, we have this story, we're developing this for our own website, but you're welcome to it uh, at any time. And uh, we've had some success with, with that kind of dynamic as well. Yeah, I'm wondering, was there a particular story where everything worked the way that it was supposed to, where maybe an external media outlet picked up on something based on the content that you already had? Or was there a moment where you felt like, just in general, you, you got over the hump and you felt like, okay, we've got something here? Well, I can tell you broadly, but uh, maybe Liz can weigh in on, on how these have played out historically on, on social as well. Um, we, just this uh, here, as we're recording this, just this last week, um, we had uh, uh, a story that we developed here internally about uh, some of our uh, science faculty who are developing um, a particle accelerator in an in a old gold mine in South Dakota. And they, um, they uh, are doing that work. They're, it's unique uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, we got that placed in a, in a pretty prominent uh, science magazine. So that was a nice uh, kind of example of we started with the story. Our media relations team pitched it out there and it ended up with a nice placement to, to tell the Notre Dame story on a, on a, on a broader scale. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier uh, that you were just looking to, to do storytelling f across this campus. Can I ask how you're sourcing these stories? How are you choosing who and, and what to, to cover? Yeah, yeah, it's a, um, there's a lot of different ways. I think the, the main thing is we, um, we have relationships with the communicators across the campus. So, you know, there's a communicator in the College of Science. There's one in the College of Engineering. Um, and, and they kind of have their, they're right there at uh, ground zero, learning what their faculty are doing or learning what their students are doing. And they'll pitch us stories to take on. And I think they know by now, over three years, we've handled their stories pretty well. Um, they know we're going to, you know, produce a good product and, and we're going to make them look good uh, in what we do as well. But I think um, it's, it's a collaborative effort that way. And we try to focus on material that will give people just, you know, just a little different uh, perspective on Notre Dame. We're, we're known for a couple of things right off the bat. Um, faith, the first one, I think a lot of people identify with our athletic tra uh, traditions as well. Um, but not everyone knows about, again, like I said, the, uh, the astrophysicists a mile underground in South Dakota. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to bring those stories up to, to the fore as well. Yeah, and I would say there's a component of social listening to it as well. I know that you just had Liz Gross on where I'm constantly out there. I'm on Reddit. I'm looking at different platforms on social media. So um, we even do it internally within our own division where our magazine might have an article that doesn't necessarily fit for them. They pitch it to us. Or I take something that I've seen on social media and bring it up to the group to just see if it's worth pursuing. Yeah, and I wonder when you're when you're picking someone and you're starting to cover the story. Uh, I believe Andy, you mentioned earlier the different technologies are, are different ways in which you're you're telling these stories. How are you deciding when you know video is going to be right here, or you know what I think actually it's just going to be animated graphics for this story, or we're going to predominantly do something text based. Uh, does that something that you have to make a conscious decision of early on in the process, or do you really not know that until you get further into the story? 
It's usually after an initial conversation with uh, the researcher or the communications director that we'll know um, this is how we're, we're going to, to tackle this one. Um, and I'd like to think that we handle it basically the same way um, a, a normal news organization would out there um, covering whatever stories they're covering in whatever city they are. Um, you know, if something is inherently visual, um, you know, we, we did a story on an artist um, way back. One of our first stories was was on an artist in residence here. And obviously that's going to make great video. That's going to make, um, you know, powerful images. You don't need to really dress that up with uh with graphics. Um, there was another one, uh, a researcher that was uh, developing temporary housing and we needed to show how these houses unfolded and you really couldn't get a good idea through a camera lens. You had to have a different perspective on it. So we ended up animating that. Um, so it, some of it is uh, what we can and can't do and what are the limitations of what you can see in a given you know, video frame. But uh, usually it's a conscious decision after a conversation or two with, uh, with the researcher. We know kind of how this is going to shake out. Yeah, and I'm curious about the process for creating this content. And in particular, I'm thinking about the, the timeline, how often you're having to interview uh, whoever the individual is that you're covering for a story. I mean, how long is it taking you from, say, story concept to story publication for, and I imagine it varies, but is there an average time length that you're working with? Average, I would say, we try to produce two stories a month. Um, one of which will be um, what I'll call templated. You know, it'll be text, but uh, it'll follow the kind of the same format, image here, cluster of images there. The other one will be a little heavier lift and more unique in its, in its design and experience uh, online. Try to do um, two a month, but those stories take about two months to create from, from start to finish. So from the initial, um, hey, I have a, an interesting project over here, conversation to everything's written, everything's built, everything's developed, um, and it's pushed on our website. It's roughly uh, two months, give or take. Now we have, you know, the longest one I think we've ever done is, is still ongoing. We, we sent a team uh, actually to Africa um, back in the spring uh, of this year, and that will probably go uh, late this summer. So that one's going to be about four or five months from, from start to finish. But uh, it's such a good story, and we're, we're telling it in a little different way that uh, we really wanted to, to take our time with that one. And I would say that on the other end of that, um, we do have some stories that we have turned around in a day when our president has been internationally traveling or traveling internationally. Um, we'll be getting kind of boots on the ground reports from our photographer there or our vice president who happens to be with him. And we um, kind of have a template ready to go and we know where we're plugging things in, but we're working crazy hours if they're in Rome or, um, you know, we're getting videos in the middle of the night that need to get uploaded to YouTube and out as quickly as possible so that um, the, the, the people that they're meeting with when they're, when they're abroad have been able to see kind of real time, this is what Notre Dame did yesterday and wow, we're going to be up there tomorrow. So we've had some really good wins with that, I think. And what Liz is mentioning there is actually a really great point um, in terms of that whole acting like a newsroom type model. Um, you know, that's what a real news organization would do if your um, if your president is making news. Um, and every and you know most colleges or marketing arms are doing this. You want to be there with the story, and you want to make sure the constituencies who care about that story have access to it as soon as it can be done. Uh, and so, yeah, it's been some uh, long hours for Liz in particular, uh, because time zones, um, you know, take no prisoners uh, on, on this stuff. And um, but, uh, yeah, we've we've had some good success uh, with with that as well. Again, trying to think of ourselves as a news organization. Yeah, of course. I imagine with a newsroom, if you're thinking of a newsroom and especially with some of these longer projects and even the ones where you're you're being forced to be more agile, it's not just the two of you. Can you can you tell me who else is on the team for this project? Sure, we have. Um, so it's it's Liz who's our social media manager. It's it's myself. I'm a director. We have um, a writer. We have a, a web designer, um, a project manager, and then we also have a, a data scientist on our team who's really added 
uh, an interesting dimension to our work. We didn't start the team with him, but he, he's not a marketer by trade, but he um, is, a, is a numbers cruncher. So he'll tell us how things are performing, page views, um, where people went to on our website after they viewed a particular story, so, so flow and things like that. Um, so that's our, our core team. And then when we need uh, web development and video work done, we partner with uh, another unit that's in our division called Marketing Communications. So six of us in strategic content, and then we partner with uh, Marketing Communications, which is a unit of about uh, 20 that serves the whole university. Incredible. I love the, the, the resources that you're just putting behind this. And it obviously shows in the quality of the work that, that comes out of that team. Yeah, it's... Um, we, we've never felt uh, rushed, I don't think, uh, other than, you know, the, what Liz just mentioned in the international stories. We've, we've been given the time to work, and I think, hopefully, that's reflected in the, the quality of what you see on indie.edu slash features. Um, you know, it, it, these things take a while to, to breathe, and really, uh, the cake takes a while to bake sometimes. And so we've been fortunate that uh, we've been given uh, enough resources and um, enough time to, to do it well. I imagine that the team you have in place has not always been in place. It, it actually looks like maybe stories launched in a bit of a, a smaller capacity, if you will, back as early as, as 2012. So how has stories evolved from that moment to where you are now five years later? So a lot of what we were doing in, in 2012 and in the early parts of this features section on nd.edu was really a byproduct of media relations. When I came on board as our social media manager in 2013, um, we were doing a lot of things with a little bit less intentionality than what we're doing now. Um, we were spending what time we did have in between pitching media outlets, trying to come up with kind of these thematic stories or um, kind of trend stories in higher education, like technology in the classroom or you know, we recognized that there are a lot of traditions on campus at Notre Dame that we hadn't necessarily ever put on paper or on a website that we were trying to put together. Um, we had two major athletes at the time who were kind of very in the public eye, but they had really good student stories as well. And that's kind of part of the Notre Dame mission is telling the story of the student athlete and making sure that people know that they are student athletes. Um, so we did a, a couple of pieces on that, but there wasn't the intentionality behind it, and we didn't have the resources consolidated together back in 2012 like we do now to be able to tell these stories the way that we are now. Yeah, as you've grown with your team, as you've become more uh, focused and, and more uh, dedicated to telling these stories, and, and maybe this is part of the, the reorganization that you mentioned earlier as well, uh, there's a moment where the stories go from interesting stories that are on a dashboard but live somewhere else to having their own unique layout and home on the website. I mean, they really became more sophisticated from an aesthetic standpoint. Uh, I mean, can you talk about when you know, or when or why that change was made and, and what the effects were of that change? Yeah, I think the, um, the insight there was um, it's hard to get out of the just the news release mindset. I think that's what we were doing a lot of around 2012. You know, whatever stories like content we were putting out then was was mostly a news release. And news releases have their purpose. And they have you know their their important tools uh, in, the, in the toolbox for sure. But I think our insight was not only should we structure around telling stories differently, but also um, rather than sending out that that news release and being done with it. Let's tell the story that we hope that news release would generate by, um, you know, insert media outlet here. Um, and then we go, we add in, well, what does that look like? And then we get inspired by the New York Times and the long form stories they're doing. Others have, have started doing the same thing. Uh, Washington Post, um, there's, there's, you know, many examples out there. So I think it's a matter of structuring, then a mindset shift, and then being inspired by, uh, some of what's being done uh, out there, outside of higher ed especially. With dedicating so many resources to these stories, and you're taking, uh, like you said, Andy, I think a little bit earlier, you have some runway here to create these stories. They're letting you bake the cake, uh, I think, as you said. Uh, are you repurposing this content and making, how are you making sure that you're making the most of the work that's being published? Yeah, so 
for the most part, the, the main home of these pieces is nd.edu, and our main outlet is the highest level Notre Dame social media accounts. Um, but frequently, we are partnering with other people on campus. Um, our Women Lead piece, which is our International Women's Day focused piece, um, that's probably our biggest uh, partnership with people on campus. So we partner with all of the colleges. We're featuring one of their faculty members. So they're taking our content about their faculty member in particular and kind of joining the larger conversation that the university is talking about on their own social channels and newsletters that they're sending out. And our alumni association is also beginning to include some of our stories in their monthly alumni newsletter. And we have another component that strategic content has kind of started putting our stamp on, which is our What Would You Fight For campaign, which also the major component of that is a, a two-minute piece on NBC during our football games. But it is also on our website, and it's also going out to all of our alums on you know the weekend that it happens, that it airs on NBC. So our things are getting a little bit more play on social media, and we're only increasing our partnerships as we you know, go down the path of this endeavor further. And the other thing on repurposing steam, and this is kind of, uh, you know, um, two birds with one stone here. We, we're trying to uh, showcase Notre Dame's uh, international presence uh, as one of our goals in strategic content. And around St. Patrick's Day, uh, we started pulling out those um, stories and, and those pieces of content that had a nice, um, Irish theme to it. We're, we're kind of big on the Irish thing here, Steve. I don't know if you knew, <laughs> but um, we uh, we had a story about uh, our Irish dance team that uh, went over to Ireland and competed in the All Ireland Dance Championships. Um, we had content around um, the 1916 documentary, which was um, developed here at, at Notre Dame and speaks to the fight for, for Irish um, independence. So there's a lot of that content that we repurposed around St. Patrick's Day and it was received uh, incredibly well. Um, it was one of those, oh yeah, moments, you know, why didn't we think of this sooner? But uh, it was a, a really effective repurposing uh, back in March. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, I think Liz, you mentioned that the Alumni Association has begun to include some of these stories in the in the newsletter or you're looking at the international focus. I'm wondering, and the answer may very well be based on just qualitative uh, feedback or anecdotal feedback, but is there a particular Notre Dame audience, albeit alumni or prospective students, where you've had or you've noticed greater success with these stories? You know, one of the one of the areas we've um, noticed uh, an uptick is honestly um, peer institutions. Uh, you know, that's, um, that's an important, uh, audience, I think for, for most colleges and universities, because, you know, they're the ones who, who rank you and that's how you move up in U.S. news rankings and, and whatever. Um, and we've seen a, a nice uptick there as a result of kind of the, the new emphasis on content and, and doing it well. Uh, that's been really interesting to see. And I think we've seen, um, the audience, the more general audience on social have uh, a nice positive uptick as well. Yeah, that's really interesting about the peer institutions. Has, was that a focus at all with the stories or has it had been almost a, an added value, so to speak? Yeah, it was a focus um, at, at the beginning. We, um, it, it's a little hard nut to, to crack a little bit because you... You don't always know, um, you know, how those folks like to get their content. And so some of this has been done through, through targeted advertising, actually. Some of it's been done um, through just we think this will play well uh, across the board. But um, on the website in particular, then also on our, our social channels, that was a, a concerted effort, yeah, to, to focus that, at that group. And I'm curious if we, t if we dive into social a little bit more, uh, Liz, have you noticed in particular, you know, just in terms of your analytics or again, anecdotal feedback, are there particular media channels where you're seeing more success or more engagement with your stories? Yeah, definitely. Um, our Facebook has seen incredible success with our stories, but if I'm being honest, it was not immediate. 
prior to strategic content being created and our first stories being launched, we were sharing a lot of um, pieces on, or we were sharing a lot of news releases. And, you know, occasionally there would be a great photo that one of our photographers took or a video that we had put together um, or things that I was just seeing on campus, but we didn't really have a component that was a story. And that first story that Andy mentioned earlier about one of our visiting artist fellows, it wasn't what people were used to seeing from us. But as we've gotten kind of two years, two and a half years into this, we've consistently delivered well-written, well-designed pieces to our audience. And I think that that's what people have come to expect from us now on Facebook. Um, Our audiences has grown, the organic reach has grown in an environment where it's not normally doing that. Our engagements have grown. And actually, one of our most notable campaigns, the What Would You Fight For campaign that I was talking about earlier, the social activity on Facebook around that increased by over 3,000% since we put a strategic content layer on top of that with a long form piece included with that that two minute piece that airs on NBC. Um, So we've seen just kind of incredible success there. And um, one of the things that we're getting into now is Instagram stories. It's been our loosest social media platform. We have a little more fun there. We know that our audience is a little younger there and there's a lot of students there. So, you know, I've been a little freer to be able to talk to them kind of as peers there, but we weren't telling the Notre Dame story there beyond beautiful photos of campus or here's a moment from an event that happened last night or things like that. And with Instagram stories, we have a whole new audience for these pieces. And since starting to publish them in January, we do a little bit more design than what you normally see on Instagram. And when we got the swipe up to read more capability in June, our click-throughs on Instagram have just absolutely exploded. And our our Instagram audience has really responded very, very well to the stories. Yeah, and I wonder with Instagram in particular, it's or Instagram versus a Facebook, it's the same story, of course, that you're linking to, but are you changing the tone in terms of how you're promoting it based on the fact that, for example, like you mentioned, Liz, you know, Instagram is is where your current students are at? Yes and no. Um, the the long-form component on nd.edu is um, written for a wide audience, and I don't think that it's something that our students wouldn't be interested in. But they're not necessarily going into nd.edu. They're already here. They don't really need to go to our flagship website to learn anything else. They have their college websites and their uh, major websites and things like that. And putting these pieces on Instagram, um, like I said, we've done a little bit more design behind them. They include photos or videos from, from the stories themselves. And we tell it in a shorter way. So that, you know, you get, we generally average about four slides or four stories on on those stories. And kind of by the end, when we were able to start doing the swipe up, we were seeing um, that those three slides prior to it were just hooking people and they were really going and um, our our average read times or the, the average time on site was staying the same as when we were just using Facebook or Twitter to push it out. So the the people who are swiping up through Instagram are staying there and actually reading the long form as well. I think it's fair to say that, I mean, the the stories feature for you has just been an overwhelming success. I mean, what does the future hold for for this endeavor at Notre Dame? We're working on uh, a number of great stories now. We're we're continuing to, to reinvent how we tell these things. You know, Liz mentioned back three years ago, people weren't used to seeing this type of stuff from us. Well, they are now. And so, you know, we're constantly asking ourselves, um, how can we, how can we get better? How can we change? We're going to see a couple of those come out even yet this summer, I think. Um, You know, I think we're going to do a lot more in video. I think we're going to make that kind of its own thing um, through another channel that I think is going to launch maybe in in the fall. Um, I think um, you can you can do a lot heavier lifts with video and you can do it a lot, a lot quicker. Um, so I think we're going to maybe double down on that, uh, just a little bit as well. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, I, I would say the future is, um, a little bit like the present because we think we have something that, that works here and we don't want to, to fix it if it's not broken. Um, so we're going to continue to do, I think the, the things that have, 
have ha- have been successful in addition to, to bringing on some of these other uh, new endeavors. A question that I have to ask, but that I know is always really difficult to answer. I mean, do either of you or both of you have a favorite story or highlight from, from features at Notre Dame? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that is a hard question. We've got two and a half years of stories here to pick from, but I, I really have two. I mentioned our women lead feature, the International Women's Day piece, and it's just so empowering. And I love the opportunity to get to know our faculty a little more personally. So we touch on the research that they do, but we also touch on who they are as a woman, as a person. So I I absolutely love that feature. And then we did a story about a year ago on um, two of our students who are undocumented immigrants. And it was a little daring for these women to publicly put a face on something that's so controversial and so politicized. And I just admire them so much for speaking out. And that, that story, I think, was so it played really well on social media because people just liked getting to know these girls and they liked knowing that there is a personal face and there is something there. And to be able to give them a voice, I I think was really powerful for me. I'm curious, Liz, with a story like that, it it makes me think, have you come across any stories where a a student or, or, you know, whoever the individual is that you're profiling has declined? They've just said thanks, but no thanks. I don't think we've been straight told no. I think we've been told wait uh, a few times, like my research isn't ready or, um, you know, but yeah, no one has said, I I don't want to do this because it'll cause trouble for me or or anything like that. And with those, those students who were undocumented, they had already been publicly speaking out themselves. It wasn't that we approached these two undocumented students and said, hey, do you want to be the face of this at Notre Dame? Um, They had written for our campus newspaper, kind of putting themselves out there. And then actually our media relations team had worked with them to place an op-ed and I think the Washington Post. And then we kind of told their story more from the Notre Dame perspective of you know, a couple years ago, we announced that we were going to accept undocumented immigrants. And there was, you know, it was kind of going to be like a blind application. We didn't care about your citizenship. So kind of tying back into something that was news a couple of years ago with, you know, this is happening now and these people are willing to speak out. And um, we were given the opportunity to be able to tell the story, I think, in a really good way. You talk about repurposing content, Steve. The, the story... Liz has mentioned it's called Shattering the Silence. It remains the most viewed story we've ever done. And it's it's interesting to see every time the immigration issue comes up in the news again, I see our story posted somewhere um, by someone on a, a social channel or something like that. Not because we've pushed it out, but because they've remembered it or they read it and they want to uh, share it on their on their own. So it's kind of this um, crowdsourced repurposing uh type thing that happens every time that that comes up. Can you both talk about just the personal satisfaction or the personal reward that you get from working on stories like this? I mean, these are really important stories in some cases. That's absolutely right. And, you know, I think um, it's, it's a, this is going to sound pie in the sky a little bit, but I think it's a privilege. I think most people who work in higher ed marketing um, have an, an immense privilege because you're, you're dealing with people um, who are using their life, their intelligence, their intellect, their skills to really make the world a better place. And it's a really easy thing to be inspired by being around people like that. We had a story um, about one of our uh, engineering faculty who is who develops biped robots, so walking robots. And uh, he's using that uh, knowledge to help um, victims of spinal cord injuries. Um, that's real stuff, you know, that's where, that's where people live. Um, we've done stories, um, on, uh, faculty who are developing technology, uh, to, um, provide better access to drinking water in Africa, um, who are, uh, working to make Mars a possibility for space travel. So it's, it's immensely satisfying when you get to be around, and maybe humbling too, when you get to be around people who, who are into this stuff, you know, and you, um, you almost, um, and there's been a couple of occasions where I'm like, I, I don't think I'm quite worthy to tell this story, but here we go. Yeah, I would agree. And we both have a background in journalism. And I think that that, 
doesn't necessarily help, but kind of informs where we come from when telling these stories. And um, I've written a couple of our long form pieces, but primarily I stick in the sandbox of social media. So I tell these stories in 140 characters or less. But to be able to do that and to be able to share, I mean, as Andy was saying earlier, people have an idea of Notre Dame and they have an idea of who and what we are. And a lot of times what they think we are stops or, or only lasts for four hours on a Saturday in the fall. And to be able to tell that story and to say, you know, this is the great research that we're doing. These are the amazing students that we have. These are the faculty that I'm able to be around. Um, that's partly why I love the Women Lead feature so much. Um, I've actually written the piece on our architecture professor for the past two years. And it's just so inspiring to hear what these two women have done. Um, one is working with the Taj Mahal in the Roman Forum in the Vatican Library. And the other takes students to China every two years and just kind of introduces them to the traditional architecture of China. And I learn so much when I'm working on these features, when I'm reading them and when I'm talking to my colleagues in strategic content, that it's just this culture of learning that that we get to cultivate on this campus. I mean, we're not cultivating it on this campus. Everyone else is. But to get to share that culture of learning really gives me great joy. I, I love coming to work and tweeting and Facebooking all day about these things. Andy, I do want to make sure we, that I give you the opportunity to, to give a shout out to a particular story. If you have one, I don't know if you have a favorite story from your time on this project. Yeah, I would. Uh, so the, every year, the University of Notre Dame gives out what's called the Laetare Medal. Um, it's considered um, the highest honor in American Catholicism. It's given to someone who, you know, um, symbolizes the faith and, and what they are doing with their with their lives and this last year we gave it to uh, Father Greg Boyle who whose story is fairly well known he uh, he's the founder of uh, Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles and uh, it's the world's largest uh, gang reentry program uh, and I had the opportunity to go out there and talk to him and just kind of find out how he views life and how he views um, the people he works with and it was uh, I think that was a highlight for me just to hear from this this man um, who and his perspective on how we're all in this together um, you know if we are a human if you're a human being you know you are you are connected to other human beings and that was really uh, inspiring for me uh, the story turned out uh, pretty well I think as well uh, we just called it G because that's how the the gang members he works with uh, that's that's how they, that's how they refer to him as father G um, so we, we kept that in there. So that would be a, a highlight for, for me. Just some incredible stories. I, I, I mean, I, I love the angle of, of telling the other side of Notre Dame, so to speak. Uh, Andy and Liz, I really appreciate you joining the Hashtag Higher Ed podcast. Uh, before we let you go, a couple housekeeping matters, of course. Um, Andy and Liz, where can listeners find you online? Yeah, great. So I am on Twitter at EA Harder. That's H-A-R-T as in Tom, E-R. Um, it's actually kind of funny. We also had a social media professional here for a while who was C-N Harder with a D on social media. So I always make sure to point out that it's a T there in my last name. And I am at, at Andy underscore Fuller, A-N-D-Y underscore F-U-L-L-E-R. And then you can follow Indie Stories at Indie Stories. Excellent. And everyone who's listening to this show should absolutely go follow at ND Stories. You should follow Andy and Liz as well, absolutely. but you should definitely follow at ND Stories. Uh, and of course, each week on this show, we ask our guests to give a social shout out to one or two colleagues or individuals uh, who deserve more recognition of their work. And Liz and Andy, I believe you came uh, to the show with a couple people in mind. I would have to say Todd Sanders, the Director of Digital Communications and Social Media for the University of Florida. He's at T Sand on Twitter. And aside from being a Notre Dame fan, which always wins points in my book, Todd posts the most delicious looking photos of food that he's cooking on a griddle in the UF social media office. And it kind of should make us all want to go work there. And he has bacon designs about the Green Bay Packers. But food picks aside, he shares a lot of behind the scenes photos of the UF social office and lets you in on a bit of their thought process. And each fall, I've had a, a good conversation with him and actually John Lucas from the University of Wisconsin about the 30 second spots that, you know, air during football games and, and just kind of critiquing and going back and forth and sharing why we've done some of the things in our 30 second spots that is just so fascinating. 
And then uh, I have a couple. One is uh, Lisa Mulcrone from Michigan State University. She's the editor of uh, MSU Today. She's at L. M U L C R O N E uh, on on Twitter. She um, I got the opportunity to, to listen to her talk about the uh, the Spartans Will campaign uh, maybe a year or, or more ago, and just implementing that. And it, it just struck me what a what a great uh, brand positioning and what a versatile campaign that was. So I thought that was uh, really impressive work. And she's a, a delight on on Twitter as well. And then the other one's not a, not a person, but I've been really impressed with uh, the work that the University of Oregon is doing. Uh, and if you follow at around O, um, that is the handle for around the O, which is their, um, kind of their storytelling enterprise. And they do incredible work, um, over there as well. Garnered them a few, uh, awards here in the last, uh, case round. So, um, University of Oregon, uh, doing great work in the Northwest. Yeah, there are just so many talented people in the higher education space, uh, multi-talented, as I've learned from Liz in terms of their cooking prowess <laughs> and cooking designs. Well, Andy and Liz, one more time, thank you so much for joining the Hashtag Higher Ed Podcast. It was really a thrill for me to, to get you on the show here after discovering Notre Dame features. You're just doing incredible work, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what content is in the pipeline for you both. Appreciate it, Steve. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you.